Reberdercho, Spain, 1845. On a cold spring morning, a young woman named Manuela Garcia and her daughter Petra packed their meager possessions. Manuela was nervous about the journey ahead of them, but she was also very happy. A friend of hers had approached her with a job offer. A wealthy family in another town was looking for a servant, and her friend had asked Manuela if she was interested in the position. She was, of course. There were limited opportunities for her in Rebordercho, the small farming town in the mountains of northern Spain, and work as a servant paid very well. The only catch was that Manuela would need to travel through the Galician mountains to reach her employer, which was no small task as the journey was long and arduous and Manuela did not know the way. Fortunately, her friend with the job offer did and had volunteered to lead her and her daughter through the mountains. Manuela felt she was the luckiest woman in Reberdercho, but still, she was nervous. She felt a little better when she saw her friend and mountain guide walking up the dirt road towards her home. A short, effeminate man with fat legs, Manuel Romasanta did not look dangerous, and since they had been introduced through her priest, Manuela believed Romasanta could be trusted. She knew nothing about werewolves, madness, or murder, but she would soon learn of all three in the cloudy mountains of northern Spain. Manuela and her daughter would never be seen alive again, and their deaths would become part of one of the strangest and darkest stories ever told. A story about a man with the mind of an animal, a French doctor in disguise, and a queen who saved a werewolf. The story of Manuel Romasanta, the werewolf of Alariz. Manuel Romasanta was likely a hermaphrodite, a person born with the genitalia of both sexes. Records indicate he was born as a baby girl named Manuela Blanco Romasanta before his name was changed to Manuel when he was six years old. His sex was likely misdiagnosed by his doctor, who at that time would have been unacquainted with such a rare deformity. Despite his condition, Manuel did what he could to have a normal life. Like many of his peers, he married and learned a trade, seeming intent on living a life of stability and peace. But when his wife died soon after their marriage, Manuel Romasanta left his hometown for the road and whatever opportunities awaited him. In the summer of 1834, Romasanta was a traveling salesman, peddling his wares through and around the Galician mountains. He partnered with a fellow salesman named Manuel Ferrero, and one day the two Manuels went together on a business trip but only one was to return. When Manuel Romasanta returned to the residence of the Ferrero family, he politely informed them that he had been sent by his partner to retrieve his wardrobe because the man had decided to live permanently in another town and was far too busy to pick up the clothes himself. The Ferrero family found Romasanta's story suspicious and sought out the local authorities to investigate. But by then, Romasanta had moved on and Manuel Ferrero was never seen again. Romasanta could read and write, traits which marked him as an educated man. Having also worked a variety of occupations, he could find work anywhere he pleased. And one day, it pleased him to visit the city of Lyon in northern Spain. Romasanta resumed his trade as a salesman, but soon found himself under scrutiny once again when he was unable to pay a local vendor for merchandise loaned to him on credit. The local constable was sent to arrest him for failing to pay the debt, a sum which amounted to no more than $150 in today's money. But Romasanta had no interest in debtor's jail and instead killed the constable when he attempted to arrest him. A warrant was issued for his arrest and Romazanta fled once again into the mountains, where he eventually found the quiet town of Roberdercho. It was there that Romazanta met Father Pedro, a local priest who had become both his friend and confidant. Father Pedro may very well have been the one to introduce Romazanta to the unmarried women of the village, and their friendship could very well have been the reason his victims trusted Romazanta to guide them through the mountains. 
Manuela Garcia and her daughter were the first to leave town with the small and seemingly harmless man, but not the last. When Roma Santa returned to Robodercho, he spoke of a successful expedition and showed off letters supposedly written by Manuela that told of her happiness in newfound land. And when he sold Manuela and her daughter's belongings, Roma Santa calmly explained that he did so on their behalf so they would have extra spending money for their new life beyond the mountains. His story was convincing and also inspiring. Others inquired about distant opportunities and if Roma Zanta could help them get there. Of course, the small man was happy to oblige. Manuela Garcia's sister, Benita, and her son Francisco were next. And afterwards, Roma Santa generously sold their belongings for them. Next was a widow named Antonia Rua and her daughters Maria and Peregrina, whose letters Roma Santa showed off with pride. And finally, a woman named Josefa Garcia and her son Jose, who were never seen again. Roma Santa's victims had followed him into the mountains, believing him to be a friend, leading them to a better life never once suspecting the monster that led them so callously to their deaths. When the families of his victims were unable to contact their loved ones, the townspeople grew suspicious of Roma Santa. There was also an unsettling rumor that Roma Santa was selling not just secondhand clothes, but soap made from human fat. Realizing the game was up, Roma Santa used a fake passport as well as the alias Antonio Gomez, and left Roberto for the city of Toledo in the heart of Spain. And it was in Toledo that Antonio Gomez was discovered to be Manuel Roma Santa. He was arrested by the authorities and taken then to the city of Alariz to face trial. Roma Santa confessed to the murders of Manuela Garcia and her daughter, as well as 11 others over a decade long killing spree. The prosecution alleged that Roma Santa targeted single mothers, earned their trust, and then lured them into the mountains with the promise of a better life. It is unclear how he killed his victims, as few bones were found in the places Roma Santa claimed to have left the bodies, but the few bones that were found showed marks of butchering. The defense pled not guilty by reason of insanity, and Roma Santa's next confession seemed to indicate that he was indeed insane. Roma Santa claimed to be a werewolf and that he had eaten his victim's flesh after murdering them. He claimed he had spent the last 13 years living a wandering life of crime, suffering under the curse which caused him to change into a supernatural animal and feed on the flesh of his victims. He also claimed to have had accomplices, two men named Gennaro and Antoni, who were also werewolves and with whom he committed most murders, though the existence of these accomplices was never proven. Roma Santa's story was not as strange to the court as one might think. According to a popular local folktale, the seventh son of all male children, born on Christmas or Good Friday, would grow to be either a powerful healer or a killer who takes the shape of a wolf. When asked by the court to change into a werewolf so he might validate his story, Roma Santa claimed he no longer possessed the ability to do so because the curse had been lifted the year before. Needless to say, Manuel Roma Santa was convicted and sentenced to death for nine murders. Of the 13 killings he had confessed to, four of those had been killed by real wolves, which led the court to believe Roma Santa was actually not insane and that his story was a premeditated attempt to receive mercy from the court. He found no mercy that day and was sentenced to death by garroting, an execution by strangulation where a chain or rope is slowly tightened around the neck of the condemned. But Roma Santa was never executed for his crimes. A French doctor, known by the pseudonym Dr. Phillips, had been following the trial since the beginning. He asked the court to be allowed to testify, believing Roma Santa to be the victim of mental derangement and therefore not responsible for his actions. 
Dr. Phillips claimed to have successfully treated similar mental disorders with hypnosis and requested the court commute Romasanta's death sentence to life imprisonment so he could be studied. His request was initially denied, but later approved when he wrote a letter to the Ministry of Grace and Justice requesting Romasanta's life be spared. Dr. Phillips' request was brought to the attention of Isabel II, Queen of Spain, who intervened on Romasanta's behalf and had the man's sentence commuted to life imprisonment. Dr. Philip never traveled to Spain to study the murderer he saved, for reasons known only to him. And in 1863, he lost his chance forever when his werewolf died in prison of natural causes. Bringing to an end the case of Manuel Romasanta, Spain's first recorded serial killer, also known as the werewolf of Alariz. <laughs>